Welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan-Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. On today's episode of The Heal Podcast, I sit down with Louis Schwartzberg. Louis is an award-winning cinematographer, director, and producer who has spent his notable career providing breathtaking imagery using his time-lapse, high-speed, and macro cinematography techniques. Schwartzberg is a visual artist who breaks barriers, connects with audiences, and tells stories that celebrate life and reveal the mysteries and wisdom of nature, people, and places. His latest documentary feature film, Fantastic Fungi, now on Netflix, explores the world of mushrooms and mycelium and illustrates how this fascinating organism can provide sustainable solutions to some of the world's greatest problems, treating cancer, Alzheimer's, PTSD, saving the bees, cleaning the atmosphere, and shifting consciousness. Wow, the power of mushrooms. The film received a 100% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and spent four weeks topping the documentary charts on iTunes. He also has a Netflix series, Moving Art, uh, which is designed to inspire, educate, and evolve our perspective on the world. Each episode immerses viewers into the natural world, taking viewers on a journey through time and space. He is also currently developing Visual Healing, an immersive health and wellness program maximizing his award-winning body of work to reduce stress and anxiety. Louis is amazing. His work is beyond beautiful and extraordinary and just reignites our passion for the mysteries and beauty of nature and the healing powers of nature. So without further ado, let's talk to Louis. So Louis Schwartzberg, thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to sit with you. Good to be here with you, Kelly. So you are... An award-winning visual artist, producer, director, cinematographer, and I just watched Fantastic Fungi for the third time, and it truly is a gift of beauty, and Mm. the time-lapse photography that you do of, of the mushrooms and flowers, I mean, it really, if you're not overcome with a sense of awe and wonder, I don't know, you know, there's problems. So tell me about how you got into this amazing line of work of, of time-lapse photography that it just, it's mind-blowing. Well, thank you. Um, well, when I, was, when I graduated UCLA, I wanted to shoot 35 millimeter movie film, but even back then, film was $100 a minute for film development processing. So a four minute roll of film would be $400. So it was one of the reasons why I developed time lapse in 35 millimeter because I wanted to shoot high resolution. I always loved, you know, fine art photographers like Ansel Adams and Edward Weston, who shot like eight by 10 inch, you know, big negatives. And for me, as a filmmaker back then, you know, 16 millimeter was more of an art form. 35 millimeter was primarily for feature films, commercials, TV shows, we're shooting in 35. So that's what I wanted to do. And But in addition, time-lapse really generates a sense of wonder and awe because you're able to see life from the point of view of a flower or from a hummingbird or an insect. And the beautiful thing about that was it meant you didn't have to shoot a lot of film. You might be shooting one frame every 10 seconds, maybe one frame every 20 minutes with a flower. So I could spend months shooting a four-minute roll of film and not spend a lot of money. When you're young, you have a lot of time and no money. As we get older, we have more money and less time. (laughs) Right? So true. And so that is what turned me on, and I still am turned on every time I see a time-lapse flower open up in my studio. I'm never going to get tired of that. And I'm never going to get tired watching the (laughs) end product because it really is so beautiful. And it's such a glimpse that, you know, we're, we're moving 100 miles an hour. For us to stop and smell the roses is a big deal today, let alone sit for hours and watch one bloom, you know, which could take days, weeks, months, whatever. Yeah. 
Um, so thank you for that sure. lovely, you know. Well, well, th- well, think about this idea. Frugal and uh, creative solution to frugality. But, but imagine if you had a mentor or a guru who said, you know, Kelly, I want you to sit in, in front of this rose and for two days and watch it open. Well, the truth is you wouldn't be able to do that because at some point you'd have to, like, get up and go to the bathroom or get some food or water. You wouldn't be able to stare at it for 48 hours. I can actually show you what that looks like if you were able to focus and look at it for 48 hours. And that, to me, is a real gift. Oh, it is. And it's it's almost like... (laughs) When I watch the flowers opening and closing on your, and even some of the mushrooms, it, they're mo- they're in movement. It's not just the flower just opens right. in one thing. It like opens, closes, opens, closes, almost like inhale, exhale, mm-hmm. expand, contract. It's so, it is, again, it's just like yeah. such a gift into the miraculous nature of nature. What you're actually is watching is day to night, you know, because what they do is they do relax at night. Like we all get tired, right? And they actually, they need to go to sleep. Right? So their muscles relax a little bit. And then when the grow lights, which is like the sunrise, comes on again, they stretch out. Wow. And, and so it is like a bit of a breathing. But one of the things that really intrigues me is they move, but they move gracefully. They move with beauty. So ask yourself the question, why is there beauty in a realm of reality that you can't see? You know, like, why is beauty everywhere? Mm-hmm. Whether it's microscopic or whether it's a, you know, a shot of a galaxy. Um, that really, you know, intrigues me to ask that question. Like, not only is it something I, I haven't seen before, yet beauty lives in these realms of the universe that are beyond human perception. Yes. So what, what have you found as you asked yourself that question? Well, I, th- the answer? I, I, think, <laughs> I think it leads you on this, you know, realization that there is some form of intelligence throughout the universe, some type of, you know, spiritual energy or consciousness that is a unifying oneness that brings it all together. And people call it God or people can call it, you know, spiritual energy. Um, But the, the rhythms and patterns that I see on the ocean or that I see on the beach or that I see inside the cells of your body are all the same. I mean, if it's all the same, then I think you can kind of lean into this idea that no matter what happens to me in this life, and maybe when you die, that it's all going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's we're all part of this fabric that never ends, never begins. You know, it's this endless journey of, yeah, death and rebirth, death and mm-hmm. rebirth. And you see that in nature, you see that in your film. And... And I love the macro micro of because after, you know, heal, the documentary is really focused on the individual, the human healing, uh, physically, mentally, whatever. But now I've kind of like widened my perspective and I'm looking at what we're doing to the earth with our consumption and and just unconscious practices and lack of reverence for this beautiful planet we have and i'm looking at it and it's like this is a, our planet is a living breathing organism and much right. like our human bodies who are a network and a community of cells and bacteria um, and fungi and other things uh the planet earth is that s- the same way and i think your film fantastic fungi mm-hmm. shows that so mm-hmm. talk to us about this <laughs> third kingdom of fungi so we know there's flora and fauna we never right. heard about fungi right. and it's amazing property. I mean, life would not exist without fungi, and there's like millions of species. Well, it's actually the largest kingdom, six times more species than plants, so it's really shocking we know nothing about it. But the beautiful thing about fungi is that it's this underground network that communicates nutrients and information, you know, between trees and plants, and it's like an underground internet, and it does it in a shared economy without greed, which I think is a beautiful example of how we could live our lives as well. Mm. Um, it, it could be the greatest natural solution for climate change. We show in the movie how carbon dioxide you know, goes into a, a plant, goes down the roots, and exchanges carbon with nutrients that it gets from the mycelial network. So it's able to sequester carbon, which is amazing, because basically what is that underground thing we extract called oil, but decomposed organic matter that we burn and put into the atmosphere and create you know, climate, 
global warming. So it can heal the planet. Um, in, it's inside of our bodies, right? Our gut. I'm sure in Heal you went deep into all that stuff because without this floral gut, uh, you can't digest your food. And they've also discovered it's like brain cells. I mean, this idea of a gut reaction, a gut feeling, or something you feel in your heart. There's, you know, neurological, there, there are neurons in your gut and in your heart, mm-hmm. not just in your brain, which is pretty remarkable. It is. You know, you can get that feeling. You walk into a room and you go, wow. You just kind of go to somebody and you connect with that person. And then they find out, oh, there's something called heart variability rate like maybe your heart rate is more in sync with that individual than somebody else Mm -hmm. which means you connect you kind of pick up to have a good vibe Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. well now i guess science can measure it but we've known this stuff yeah i think for centuries right exactly you get a vibe off somebody you get a feeling about somebody feelings in your heart feelings in your gut anyways getting back to fungi (laughs) they are in your gut I think 20% of your body is like, you know, fungi. And I think if you add bacteria, it's like 80% of your body. Mm -hmm. You know, so we are, we have a trillion cells in our body. We're a giant universe ecosystem. And the fact that it all works together and fungi is like a critical component from that. Mm -hmm. And another amazing fact is that we evolved from fungi. You know, there was plants and fungi and then animals broke off of fungi, which is why... Getting back to healing, penicillin has saved more lives than any other medicine because penicillin fights the same viruses that we need to fight in our immune system as well. So when you take, you know, uh, penicillin or when you have, you know, mushrooms that build your immunity, they are geniuses of chemical warfare. And why are they geniuses of chemical warfare? Because the difference between fungi and us, they they digest their food externally. Mm-hmm. They secrete enzymes. They break down food, organic matter, and absorb it. What we do is we have a stomach, and we break down food internally and absorb it. Um, think about that. I mean, plants take energy from the sun. We, don't, we can't do that. Fungi cannot do that. We have to actually get our energy from a plant, mm-hmm. whether it's decomposed or whether it's alive. Yeah. Um, because the sun is the source of all energy, right? And the symbiotic relationship with fungi and animals and plants is what makes the world go round. It's so amazing how it's all connected. <clears throat> and back to what you were saying about the mycelium, which literally as you're filming it, or I don't know if it was digital. Uh, ha- like A combination how- of techniques. Yeah, it was, yeah, it's so fascinating to see like under ground and these networks and it's almost like neural networks it's almost like interstitial tissue but it's communicating and this is the intelligence of nature it's actually the fungi with these mycelium networks connecting the roots of trees sharing nutrients and also like the mother tree that created the seedlings if there's a parasite on the mother tree it'll create like hostile fungi to keep their babies like farther their baby trees farther away to save them from the parasite it's like this it we think that oh it's just a mushroom it's just some like wild thing but they're it's like this highly intelligent Mm -hmm. you know symbiotic well well, the mushroom the mushroom is actually the fruit mycelium is the organism so it's like the apple to the tree so this giant underground network exists and um I think that's sort of like an important thing that people have to understand. The mushroom is like just a fruit. It pops up when it needs to reproduce, you know. But we, I guess it's it's hard to know about mycelium because it's underground. underground. It's, you know, maybe one cell thick, yet it's the largest organism on the planet. There's a patch in Oregon that's like 2,000 acres, which is amazing. That's so, crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... They've even found it underneath the ocean, underneath the uh, sedimentary rock at the bottom of the ocean. And for thousands fungi. of years. It's, it's, yeah. And fungi can live for thousands of years, as long as they have a food source that they exactly. can break down and digest, mm-hmm. as we see in the film. It's almost like the forest floor's digestive organ, too. Right? Yeah, it, yeah. It de- decomposes the rotting trees, the dead animals, the, and, and then all of a sudden births new life through yeah. this, what it's created. It's. I mean... 
we would choke on organic matter if there wasn't fungi to help break things down so that there's you know basic elements molecules for plants to absorb so in a way it's not creepy like ooh decomposition or the end of life it could be perceived as the beginning of life because if you don't have the building parts to make something you can't build anything right right <laughs> so it could be the beginning of life i mean life's a circle mm-hmm. there really is no beginning or end and it's one constant evolutionary cycle yeah and it's so funny you talk about in the film you <laughs> go into um penicillin you you go into these global pandemics with yeah. like what, what kind of that was a little insightful and foreshadowing of yes. what was coming so how do you see tell us a little bit about you know the promises of of because they kind of there's fungi and these networks that connect everything they're so intelligent they actually like come up with defenses against these viruses and kind of, you know, air quotes, vaccinate Mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah. So how can we use that intelligence to maybe protect humanity in in this pandemic or future ones? Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting that we we talked about pandemics and and the uh, the flu epidemic in the 1900s. Um, Well, what's beautiful about fungi do is that for human beings that they help build our immunity. And we talked about the fact that, for example, turkey tail is a really powerful ingredient in treating breast cancer. Um, so what they are, again, are geniuses of chemical warfare to be able to create new chemistry. Actually, I love this phrase, they're edge runners. Mm. What's an edge runner? Because they are they kind of you know go out in a circle. You ever see these like fairy circles? Have you heard about mm-hmm. they pop up in a circle and they think it's about fairies? It's because they expand in a circular way. They're looking, they're exploring their environment. And whatever they run into, it could be friend or foe, right? Mm-hmm. Either I'm going to absorb you, you know, maybe some decomposed you know, insect or a branch or something. Or it could be a virus that could be wanting to eat mycelium. And so it's going to come up with a chemistry to deal with that, which means it has to be inventive. It's not putting out the same enzyme over and over Mm. and over because it's always engaging new things in its environment. Therefore, I think it's really powerful for human beings as a medicine because we are also encountering new viruses like COVID-19 and and now we have the Delta variant (laughs) because it mutated. And so you want the genius of of mycelium fungi that can be able to come up with a new formula to combat something that you've never experienced before. Yeah, so exactly. So the intelligence of the fungi, we've uh, animals and then humans came out of Mm -hmm. the fungi kingdom, which I think is so fascinating. All this connection and intercommunication that our bodies, our bodies, when they break down in disease, it's because that communication has been disrupted or interfered with or accumulation of toxins or whatever, or killing the good fungi. fungi. Right. So um, let's talk about the tremendous healing powers of mushrooms. You just said that turkey tail has been very effective at helping treatment and also treating uh, breast cancer yes. in women. I think it's so fascinating in the film, and this is kind of a wink from God, but the, the man you follow in the film, what's his name, Paul? Right, Paul Stamets, yeah, yes. He's like, he's made his life studying mushrooms, and then his mother comes down with breast cancer, stage four nonetheless, and she was in her 80s, so was not recommended to have treatment or right. surgery, uh, and so the doctor recommended turkey tail and how ironic or maybe not, you know, a nice synchronicity that her son had been studying the healing power of mushrooms. So Um, then there's also um, reishi, which boosts our immune system, reishi mushrooms, right? And then lion's mane, they're they're seeing, you know, neurogenesis. Yes. And and maybe Alzheimer's, yeah. And Alzheimer's, yes. What else? What else you got? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I think cordyceps gives you energy as well. Um, I think it's just great that somehow there's this miracle how nature has, you know, created these molecules, or let's say the mushrooms have, that is actually a benefit to man. And then you have to kind of wonder, well, why, you know? And I think that it goes to this giant idea of, 
symbiotic relationships that do exist in in nature. I mean, nothing lives alone. I think the nature documentaries have skewed so far to like the macho story of kill or be killed, survival of the fittest. The real story of nature is about billions of little interactions like that are happening in your body right now, that are happening everywhere right now in this moment. Trillions of interactions are going on at a molecular level, at a microscopic level, in a handful of soil. Okay, That's life. That's the true story of life. Complex interrelationships. And I consider that to be more the feminine side of nature because mm. it's all about relationships, connection, regeneration, rebirth, uh, nurturing, mm -hmm. not kill or be killed. Yeah, you communicating, know? cooperating. Yeah, and not like, you know, doggy uh, dog. Right. Not extreme competition. Survival all, of the fittest. Exactly. And not hoarding and no greed. Doesn't exist either. Mm -hmm. So beyond being in this grand story on a biological, scientific level, I think it's a moral compass how we could really live our lives. It could be the, you should replace the Ten Commandments that they teach in elementary school or in any school. Mm -hmm. You know, teamwork, symbiosis, relationships, cooperation, right? Yeah, that's how you evolve and thrive as a species. Exactly. Otherwise and, you kill yourselves. And in personal relationships as well. Mm -hmm. You have to have all those components. Exactly. I actually heard something so interesting lately <clears throat> that Charles Darwin, at the end of his days, there, if you take like, his later writings, mm -hmm. he actually wrote about kindness more than competition. So his philosophy at the end of his life was actually <clears throat> it's more survival of the kindest. And that yes. is <clears throat> kind of what we're seeing now. We're in like the time in history, which there's arguably this has been throughout history, throughout time. There's polarization and uh, just so much fighting and hostility in the world and in society and in politics <clears throat> and everything else. So you know, we do need to pivot back to what nature can show us that we thrive in, in community. We thrive yeah. in cooperation and kindness and sharing of information and nutrients, et cetera. Darwin was really a botanist, and the bulk of all of his writing was about plants. And what happened in the 1930s is his theories were hijacked by Teddy Roosevelt and the whole imperialistic movement that justified invading third world countries and saying that you know, white people were superior, more technologically advanced, to over, and overcoming and conquering indigenous cultures. It was wrong, you know, and I think it was manipulated for political, mm -hmm. you know, mil military purposes. Mm -hmm. But people don't really realize that 98% of what Darwin wrote was all about plants and interactions of plants. And what you said is quite true. It is survival of the kindest. Mm. I love that. And so <clears throat> you also cover a bit in the in the film about psilocybin and yeah. the benefits of mushrooms, magic mushrooms or psychedelics on mental health issues, as well as perhaps, you know, complementary help for cancer treatment and, and, sure. and other things. And I think that's so cool because, again, it's it, the way you present it in this film is not only such a visual beauty, which is an experience for the viewer in itself, like just to watch a strawberry go from seedling to turning red, red ripe, and, and the redness is a signal to nature that it's ready to be consumed. It's like if you just step back and look at what you presented, you you walk away with such a gratitude and awe mm. for the intelligence of nature. And so nature, there's so much scientific research on how healing nature is. So if anybody out there that has a kind of a judgment against psychedelics or, mm. you know, maybe, because there's, all, as with anything, you can abuse it. You could use sure. it in the wrong way. but. Um, I think watching your film really helps ground it in, in oh, no, nature has so much to teach us and yeah. also gifts to give us. And so, you know, whether it's PTSD or severe anxiety and depression or, or help with cancer, um, you show that psilocybin mm -hmm. in the right environment and with the right support can be so healing in one, two or three sessions rather yeah. than some sort of ongoing pharmaceutical. It's a miracle that, you know, psilocybin mushrooms came up with a molecule that can unlock a receptor in your brain that can, you know, help you go on a mystical journey. 
And again, you have to ask this incredible bigger question, why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, maybe they want us to like live in harmony with the planet so that we can all survive, and they're trying to speak to us. How else would they speak to us? But chemically, right, they don't speak language. Actually, all animals and insects, I mean, all plants and insects communicate chemically. But I'm very excited with the psychedelic renaissance that's happening right now. In the movie, we showed examples of Johns Hopkins of cancer patients being treated with psilocybin to overcome, you know, um, the distress and anxiety of a severe diagnosis. And obviously, with all the work you've done with HEAL, you understand that you get this news, you've got cancer, and on top of it, you're thinking, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. So what about that anxiety and stress over your physiological, you know, problem that you've got? I've got this mental fear exactly. about what is, because nobody has the answer what happens when you die. It, in general, is everyone's greatest existential fear mm-hmm. is, you know, dying. And now you've got dying and you've got cancer, you know? Mm-hmm. So if you can eliminate that fear, which is what these sessions do, it's really, really, really remarkable because then you are able to potentially take that energy and heal your body mm, exactly. by, by not having the fear and anxiety. And many of the patients that we interviewed are still alive today. And I think that is really important. What's also really cool to share with you is only like five miles from here at St. John's Hospital, we have a clinical trial combining psilocybin with my imagery of rhythms and patterns of nature because the combination of nature's medicine with mushroom medicine called magic mushrooms or psilocybin to help patients with addiction to help in this case alcohol addiction and so it helps them like feel the oneness as they begin their journey and then they do the therapy like we see in the movie where they lay down with the therapist on a couch listening to music and eye shades and then there's a video that helps them get grounded as they're coming down from that journey. Mm. And then to be able to then talk to the therapist and have integration about what they discovered. You know, what's beautiful about, I think there's a corollary between, in my movie we talk about bioremediation, for example, how mushrooms can clean up an oil spill, Mm -hmm. you know? I think the mushrooms, when they go into your body on a psychedelic journey, what they're doing is they're unearthing a trauma that is buried. Mm. That's why it's healing. It's not just because it gets you, it doesn't get you high. It can actually be uh, a quote unquote bad trip or a little bit, you know, challenging Mm -hmm. to uncover a trauma. But by doing that, that could be the root of someone's addictive behavior. Correct. Right? So it's like it's like ten years of therapy wrapped into a one day session. Yeah. It's amazing. We spoke to a vet who we're going to have on the podcast again, and he achieved that through ibogaine, which is another, the aboga plant. So right. it's all sorts of plant medicine. I, I think that um, psilocybin, like you said, and, and maybe it's with, you know, different plant medicines, but I think especially with psilocybin, you, you're, the, the studied patients overcame their fear of death, which arguably could be the root of all fears, which then we know fear leads to stress, leads to disease. So getting rid of that while someone's going through a devastating diagnosis, right. just that is so liberating of energy, as you said. But also the oneness. I mean, there's so much for people that have trauma. There's a disconnection. There's an isolation. There's a loneliness. So. <laughs> Just in, and they say like isolation and loneliness is the precursor to so many diseases now as well, which we saw during COVID was right. You know, sped along a lot of people's deaths, which is devastating and so sad. So that it's that intelligence of the actual mushroom going through the body, uncovering whatever it needs to uncover, and then also just that just the sense of oneness and connection to the universe and each other, you lose that fear of dying, and then you, you kind of like a re-software programming your, your, your brain towards love. Mm-hmm. It's like a reintegration of, of, of where we came from. It's amazing that most of the patients have a universal reaction, which is they say, first of all, they can't describe it. It's ineffable. But when they do, it's love. Mm-hmm. And we all know that love is a healing modality. So it's wonderful that you know, for thousands of years, poets, musicians have, you know, have talked about love and the power of love. 
Um, but now science measures it by how much endorphins or serotonin is being released in your bloodstream, et cetera, et cetera. But, but love is where it's at. Yeah, and, and it's, it's just so cool. Staying on the subject of mushrooms, I think a lot of people f- have judgments about them because they are so enigmatic. They, mm-hmm. they can... Uh, what, is it? what did you say? Well, they can heal you. They can feed you. Oh, yeah. they, can they can kill you. They can get you high. They can feed you. They can heal you, and they could kill you. Yeah. Um, and and in in you know as with anything, people abuse them. So the people that are afraid of you know or have judgments about drugs, it's a shame but, that people you know misuse them recreationally to t- you know to but, give some but, stigma but, to. It. Allow me just to correct you. I yeah. don't think a mushroom should ever be considered a drug. Okay. It was Great. never it was never a drug until Richard Nixon, who happened to be a criminal, declared the war on drugs and made psilocybin and LSD, you know, uh, stage one drugs, you know, schedule one drugs. Okay? It was never a drug. It's not a drug. So people that was a bit of like, you know, propaganda that was put upon the American people. And why did Richard Nixon do it? It was a way to get back at his political enemies, the anti-war protesters, uh, people of color, women, people don't vote for him. Not that different from Donald Trump, I had to say. <laughs> so um, that's what happened. And all the research that was going on at Stanford and at Harvard and at UCLA came to a halt, which triggered Timothy Leary, and Ram Dass and that whole explosion, and it all went underground, and we all know it went off the rails a little bit. But it all happened because of one crazy individual called Richard Nixon, <laughs> you know, who, by the way, was like, you know, I'm reading these books now, like he was uh, right before his impeachment, he was like, you know, drinking like crazy, alcoholic, getting his, like, you know, people to pray with him on the carpet inside the Oval Office, the guy was a little unhinged, you know? <laughs> and that's what... He could have cre- used a little psilocybin. Exactly. So anyways, that's what created the whole, you know... St- and the, the reality is we're still suffering from that decision that was made with all the mass incarceration and people of color, which is uh, ethically and morally wrong. Yeah, there's so much that gets tainted in the narrative because of, of yeah. politics and yeah. then, you know, the, the repercussions of lives. So, so for thousands and thousands of years, these have been sacred medicines that indigenous cultures, you know, whether it's ayahuasca in South America or the, you know, the in, in, in northern Mexico with um, psilocybin. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've been doing it for thousands of years. Gordon Wasson, you know, from Harvard, shows up in 1955 and discovers magic mushrooms. No. Yeah. <laughs> Marie Sabina had been doing it you know, for thousands of years. I mean, her, her tribe, her culture, her people. So I think it's important that, you know, for the audience to understand that this has been going on for a very long time in a, in a respectful way, not to get high, not as recreational, but typically a once-in-a-lifetime rite of passage for a young adult to be able to have a mystical experience probably better than having a bar mitzvah <laughs> or going through some other, you know, religious ritual yeah. where you're just like, you know, reciting prayers, you know, yeah, but you, to actually feel it. To have your own individual mystical experience, yes. which then the, the, it, they speak specifically to you, the plants, whether it's ayahuasca or, or peyote or psilocybin or marijuana or whatever, yeah. these that medicine people were trained to use mm-hmm. in a way that would would give these people probably healing through that connection, that oneness, but also if it's like a rite of passage, it inspires you t- for your gifts. It kind of reveals your gifts too. True. Yeah. Uh, in my experience. True. <laughs> no, it, it's true. So it's, I mean, it's custom fit. I, I was interviewing um, from Kiss the Ground, R- Ryland, you know, a good buddy of mine, who you know, Cafe Gratitude. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he just had a, a story of how he was sort of a lost, you know, 16, 17-year-old, all of his buddies and he was in Northern California were getting jobs in Silicon Valley. He really didn't know what he wanted to do. And he actually went on a journey with his parents at a young age. And then it clicked for him as to what he wanted to do in his life, you know, to be involved with food, healthy food. Um, it's just, you know, one little story, but I think it's kind of remarkable. Obviously, like, whoever would think of getting high with their parents or having a magical experience, but why not? <laughs> yeah. You know? 
it's, yeah, most of us are like, oh, that'd be awkward. <laughs> but, but it's, you know, that's amazing. That's what's what a, what a healthy family. Yeah, and it, and that does occur, you know, in other cultures. Exactly. All the time. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, what? Tell us about this summit you've pulled together, mm. because again, this is it's the it's a king. It's the largest kingdom. We know yeah. about flora. We know about fauna, but fauna actually came from fungi, which we're a part of. And it obviously plays so much of a role in nature. And, you know, it's it's the third kingdom. It's the yeah. first kingdom, really, right? In a way, well, plants or fungi. Okay. It's hard to know. You know, there's a theory that maybe um, a fungi molecule landed on our planet Earth on an asteroid. So it came because fungi can actually live in outer space, which is pretty remarkable. That's so, so cool. you know, probably landed on an asteroid. And that could have, you know, been the beginning of life. Wow. But we'll never know. Yeah. But it's pretty fascinating to think about. The the oldest fossils of a living organism are fungi. So yeah. there's a clue right there. Right. Okay? And and when the dinosaurs went extinct because the asteroid, the meteor shower or whatever, you know, <clears throat> fungi is what rejuvenated the entire planet. Yeah, I mean, they've survived they all survived. the great extinctions because yeah. they, they can live underground. They're able to decompose the, the dying dinosaurs or plants, whatever. And they may probably survive us as well yeah. if we don't get our act together. So getting back to the question, though, about the summit, right? Yes. So this is really great because we have so many different, I think, pillars involved around the world of mushrooms. I mean, there's so many ways you can get into it. You can get into it through cooking, culinary. You can get into it through shifting consciousness. Get into it in terms of healing, uh, the environment. And just, I think, education about, like, you know, what is the mycelial network? You know, hello, don't teach it in botany anymore. Yeah. That'd be like teaching giraffes about botany, you know. They don't go together. They're, yeah. they're different. Um, so we've interviewed 50 remarkable people that are leaders in the space. We're calling the, the voices of the underground. Um, and so however you kind of get into that conversation... It, it's also like a portal into nature's intelligence, mm. you know, because there's many ways to get into nature's intelligence. Mushrooms is one way. Flowers would be another way, right? And we've collected all these great voices that we have on October 15th. It's going to be a virtual summit. You'll be able to go into these different mush rooms ah. and have conversations about food, about health, about psychedelics, and do a deeper dive, and there'll be panels. And... Um, it's great. I mean, I think what we're trying to do is take the wisdom from below the ground, above the ground. Love it. And it's who are some of the, the experts that people might know? Well, people that you've interviewed as well. Michael Beckwith, Jack Kornfield, Deepak Chopra, Andrew Wilde, Paul Stamets, Dr. Mark Hyman, um, artists like uh, Rob Gazzara, uh, chefs like Rick Bayless, Spike Mendelson, celebrity chefs, <laughs> um, Eugenia Bone. Uh, we have a cookbook. Actually, we just put together a recipe submitted by our community from all over the world that we'll be able to launch uh, during the summit. Cool. And people will be able to um, you know, down, stream these uh, conversations and be able to, I think, nurture that wisdom for a long period of time. Oh, there's so much that mushrooms can offer us and, and you know, just understanding how, like, how much they can boost immunity and learning which ones can do what. It's so fascinating to me. Um, this may be a random question, but yeah. you may have a perfect answer for it. As I'm watching, you know, your visual art and these kind of kaleidoscope, I see so much symmetry in nature and flowers. Mm -hmm. Even in mycelial networks, it just feels very symmetrical to me. It feels like there's, mm -hmm. even if you look at constellations or galaxies in, in photography, you know, there's just symmetry. There's, there's order in the chaos. Yes. How does mathematics play in in what like yeah. have you learned anything about the correlation between fungi and mathematics well i think mathematics is just a tool t to study the symmetry that you're describing you know it's uh, a way to put it into formulas and numbers but there is a universal um, intelligence and um, pattern in the universe science observes patterns you know in order to explain what reality is to mm -hmm. us and artists do the same thing. We look at patterns, but we, we're able to tell stories about how it inspires us. Um, we're both trying to explain 
what the heck all of this is, right? What makes the world go round? Perhaps the scientist is more about the how and the artist is more about the why of something, mm -hmm. you know, whether it could be like a bee landing on a flower and the scientist will explain, well, yeah, it's taking pollen and it's going to, you know, stick it to its legs and it'll carry it to the, you know, back to the brood and all that. But on the other hand, you're going, wow, this flower just turned on a bee to come land on it with sensory energy of color, taste, touch, and smell. It turned that bee on, right, to say, come get me. Hey, I need to reproduce, right? That's the story of romance. Wild. That's a love story. It's a love right? story. It's a love story. So there's two ways of telling that story, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and wonder and awe, I think, is the intersection between both. Yes. You say we have a natural tendency to protect what we love. Yeah. And you, you, so your intention with Fantastic Fungi and probably all of your work is to fall in love again with nature, to get the audience to fall in love with nature, which mm -hmm. is exactly my experience of watching Fantastic fun Fungi. So talk to me a little bit more about yeah. the healing powers of beauty in nature. I think beauty is nature's tool for survival because we, we protect what we love. And I think we're hardwired to do it. That's why puppies are cute, kittens are cute, all babies are cute. If they weren't cute, you wouldn't raise them. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I think that the environmental movement hasn't worked as well as it could have because you would assume that if you put the science on the table, like global warming, for example, that uh, people would understand and shift their behavior. Well, the fact is it doesn't. What does shift behavior, I believe, has to be a shift of consciousness. I mean, since Earth Day 1970, we've known about you know, global warming, we've known about recycling, we've known about, you know, renewable energy. Nothing is new from that period, yet we haven't changed our behavior. And I feel that what I'm trying to do with, with the films I make is to appeal to the heart. If you appeal to the heart, you will automatically do the right thing and have the right values and, you know, uh, recycle a stack of paper instead of throwing it away because you go, oh, my God, I love the forest. I love trees. It hurts. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, I should recycle. I should be shredding this paper or doing whatever you're supposed to do, you know? And I think if we do that, you can get people to make the right choices, vote for the right candidates that would have the right policies and government, which is what we need as well, clearly. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to tell people how to vote at all. Mm -hmm. You just tell them that, get people who share your values. And we have to, I think, shift people's consciousness in order to do that. Yeah, I totally agree. Exactly. The, the, what, what, we, what we've been doing has not been working. And no. I think that the, the, with every issue that I'm seeing in society, whether it's racism, um, I mean, the, our environment mostly, and lobbying and all of these other things that are kind of corrupting the systems and um, just really keeping people... Mm -hmm. oppressed and, and sick and unhealthy and vulnerable. Um, but it could also be a bridge, I think, in, in, the, in the gap we have now in this polarized world. Mm -hmm. I mean, why can't we reach across the aisle and, and, you know, first of all, have communication, but say, hey, do you want, do you want a better life for your children? Mm -hmm. Do you want them to have the same culture that you did going duck hunting, you know? Whatever that might be, well, then we can't pollute the lake, you know? Yeah. And if you want your kids to do that, the way you grew up. I mean, we can have that conversation as opposed to putting them off by saying, look, I'm an environmentalist, you know, and what you're doing is terrible. Yeah. And, you know, you got to like, you know, stop using pesticide on your farm and all these reasons. Like, let's just try to get there from what we can, a bridge of shared values. Yes. And because it's easy for people to get defensive and that's what's happening right now. And mm -hmm. it's been exasperated with media and politicians mm -hmm. that leverage that for their own benefit, mm -hmm. you know? So I think we can combat that. And how do you combat that? Because like, what guys like, I hate to use his name, but the former president did, it was like, it's, he's pushing the fear button. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for us to go there. You know, it's like a train wreck. It's hard not to look at that. Yeah. The only way I think to combat that is with something more powerful. And I think that's beauty. I agree. You know, it's got to grab you emotionally because it can't just be, oh, that's wrong or don't do that, you know. And it's got to be like, whoa, that's amazing. Check this out, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, 
because that thing over there is a wreck. This thing over here is art. Yes. What do I want to look at? Exactly. Uh, well, I appreciate you doing that through your films. They are <laughs> so beautiful. They're a healing experience in themselves watching. But like you said, I think everybody, we're, we're the answer. We're the, you know, I think, I think every person has to speak with their actions and their dollars. Um, and if you open their heart mm -hmm. through beauty, through love, through connection, whether it's, you know, you're highlighting, again, you know, underprivileged people or, or a, a dying ecosystem or a polluted ocean, um, just getting people back into that sense of wonder and gratitude and awe so that they think twice about treating a certain person a certain right. way or, you know, disrespecting nature or being wasteful or whatever. It's like, you're right, that, that access is through the individual's heart. Yeah. So thank you for leading the charge in, in your beautiful films. And um, where can people find the summit, the Fantastic Fungi Summit, and your film? Well, they go to fantasticfungi.com, and they can, you know, there's a landing page. It'll take them on that journey, and that's great. Um, and, yeah, I think that's the most important place they can go right now. Also, I do have a series on Netflix called Moving Art. If they ever just want to go on their own personal journey, it's music, narration, I'm sorry, it's music and imagery with no narration, you know? And um, so we have uh, titles like Forest, Desert, Flowers, um, New Zealand, uh, beautiful places to experience. And I think it's important to bring that sacred energy, especially to people that are never going to have the money or the health or the ability to travel to like Machu Picchu mm. or, you know, Angkor Wat or all these extraordinary sacred places, which unfortunately are disappearing because of climate change and ecotourism. It's kind of getting out of control. But they were sacred for a reason, and I think it's good to capture that. So, um, and again, those, that type of programming is what I am also introducing into healthcare. Again, separate from psychedelics, but at UCSD, at the Jacobs Medical Center, every patient has an option to be able to look at my work because we, they are offered a question on their iPad, which has their medical records and the ability to control the lights and shades in the room. The question is, where in the world do you want to go to be healed? And you're giving patients a power of choice when choice has been taken away. And the options are forest, desert, flowers, ocean, and they can just kind of be in that ecosystem for a half hour. Oh, it's so it's the one, you know, I mean, think about the fact we have all the sensory receptors, right? 80% yep. of the data you get goes into your eyes. It's the most important sensory receptor, but there is no visual healing modality for it. You've got massage for touch, you know, music for hearing, uh, aromatherapy for smell, healthy food for taste. Vision is by far the most important sensory receptor. As a matter of fact, scientists say it's an extension of the brain. It's really not that different. Immediately, light energy, you know, hits your eye, turns it into electrical impulses that creates this image in your head, which really is not an image when yeah. you think about it. There's no TV screen up there, right? How does it do that? Oh, my gosh. How does it do it? <laughs> it's, it's just electrical energy going through neurons. It's wild. And, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's no healing modalities through vision. Right. Except for moving art on Netflix. Yes, exactly. But, you know, there's tons of scientific research that we've talked about on this show and in, in HEAL where if someone is recovering in a hospital, their wound healing, their yep. vitals, everything is improved just by looking out a window at a tree or looking at some sort of nature visual. So you're literally mm -hmm. bringing people healing into their hospital yeah. room, which is so cool. We got to do better than a window. Yeah, we got to do a lot. Better. You know, we got to do better than just a window. And the window could be to another building across the way, by the way. Yeah, exactly. But again, it's more than just a picture of nature because I do take people, I make the invisible visible by showing things with time lapse, slow mo, micro, and macro. Mm. So what you're doing is you're already breaking the narrow uh, confines of human vision, mm. and we're stuck. Most people are stuck yeah. that have problems. So if you can just break that for a moment, mm -hmm. then you get the idea of being more open-minded and being able to explore. And that in and of itself creates um, a certain, I think, uh, platform for elevating consciousness. Yes. And I also <laughs> think that 
you know, we talk about a lot in heal is just disrupting that fear cycle, disrupting that pain, disrupting that your focus on your issue or disease. Mm -hmm. And so to take them on that journey and give them something that we don't normally see through time lapse, through this beauty, you know, they can't help but feel awe, gratitude, curiosity. It takes, it disrupts that fear, misery, whatever the, right. those feelings are that's releasing, that's slowing or inhibiting their ability to heal mm -hmm. and opening up those energy reserves, dropping them into parasympathetic nervous system for healing. Right, right. So it's, it's, it's such a good gift. Thank you. I can't wait to check it out. Look, there's so many fun facts you could discover about mushrooms. As a matter of fact, if you go to the educational hut during our summit, we actually have an educational version that we are going to be giving away for free, K through 12. We took out the references to psilocybin because we have to make it shorter anyways. Mm -hmm. And we're just turning young people on to the magic of this underground, you know, mystery universe that does exist. And learning all the values that the mycelium have, like symbiosis and connection and relationships. So there's so much to learn. We have a 100-page curriculum and a study guide for teachers and parents to be able to, you know, help guide their children and learn about fungi. Um, anyone can, you know, grow a tomato on their back porch or have a garden and do all the things that can teach young children, like, where did your food come from, you know? And without the mycelium and without the fungi, there are no plants. So it's very important. It is very important to teach our kids. It's, can't wait. Can't wait to watch it. All right, guys, we'll go to fantasticfungi.com and check it out. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gorris. Thank you so much and be well.